Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast, where we teach clients how to build wealth and create passive income without the risk of Wall Street. Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast. I'm Cameron Christensen, along with our co-host, Anthony Faso. And we just wrapped up our conversation with Wade Fow, the retirement researcher. Anthony, what are some of your thoughts? Well, my first thought is to correct you. Oh, boy. Uh, he... Wade, this is Dr. Wade Fowler. He <laughs> is a doctor of retirement. He has a PhD. So, Cameron, please show him the, the respect <laughs> he deserves. Now, this was a really good podcast. And maybe I'm, maybe why, I'm a little biased. Why are you so surprised? Yeah. This, I, honestly, this podcast was much better than I thought. To, to be honest, getting somebody with a PhD. Like I've I've read his work, we've read his books, but most sometimes PhDs may not be as interactive or or articulate to be able to verbally explain it. Man, he hit it out of the park. Yeah, really. And what we're talking about is really what, Cameron. What would you say most people's goal are when they're in retirement? Income. Like with their assets. In income. Right? Absolutely. Income. And cash flow, right? And we need to be concentrating on that cash flow now. And what he shared is one of the downsides, if you have all of your assets in retirement assets, which is like uh, a, a stock and bond portfolio, there are some risks or limits because of the volatility of the market of how much you can take out. And so he goes in to explain that and really – Kind of the the downside is you may not have to be able to have as much cash flow in retirement as you'd like. And he wrote a great white paper a few years ago, and he really went in deep on some different scenarios. Really, what if you buy term and invest the difference, or what if you how you have some whole life and the real barometer should be which one provides more cash flow in retirement. And he goes into deep and compares those. And a little spoiler alert, having some life insurance as part of your assets allows you to have more cash flow in retirement. So that copy of that white paper, that's going to be in the show notes. And we also did a five-part series called Maximizing Cash Flow in Retirement. And that's part of the infinitewealthcourse.com where we do some of the math of what Wade Fow is talking about. And at least to me, the coolest part is the bottom line is we have a case study in there. Mm -hmm. We have a case study. Okay, this is what you're on track to have cash flow with. By just reallocating a couple of things, here's how much cash flow you could have. What was some of the takeaways that you had, Cam? Yeah, the first thought that I had was uh, after our conversation with him was that, wow, the doctor of retirement. Yep. Thank you. Yes, uh, has a whole life insurance policy and is a huge fan of it, right? And not only is he a fan, but he tells us why and how it fits in with his portfolio and or at least his strategy. So. Great conversation piece there. And then the other takeaway that I had was, man, if you step back and you look at the conversation that we just had, nobody else is having this type of conversation, mm. right? And what I mean by that is what we just got through talking about with Dr. Wade Fow was really buffer assets. And buffer assets is uh, really there's three of them. There's cash, there's whole life insurance, and then there's reverse mortgages, we talk about whole life insurance a lot with some of the strategies that we implement, but man, specifically reverse mortgages and how somebody is able to tap into that as a tool to be able to increase their income in retirement was phenomenal. And nobody else is talking about that. Now, why do you think like typical financial planners aren't talking about whole life or reverse mortgages or real estate? Great question, and I, I know for a fact why is because they don't sell it, right? Or mm. it doesn't fall under their umbrella of the traditional planning of stocks and bonds. That portfolio doesn't include any of those things. And you know as well as I know that that's just not the case for most clients as they come in and they have a whole bunch of real estate holdings. They have a mortgage. They have a mortgage that's gonna they're going to have to continue to pay into retirement. And what we talked about were strategies to address that. So it's a much more holistic approach. Uh, when you look at and you take into consideration all these other assets that uh, clients will typically have. Okay, that's one refreshing thing I like about this podcast is we're not 
only talking about things that are in our wheelhouse. We're talking about things that are going to help you achieve your goals. If they're going to help you, we, we, we are going to share those ideas, whether we profit from it or not. We're just, we're, we're trying to educate you. We're trying to help you achieve financial freedom. And again, that's not just passive income more than your expenses, but we want to educate you, um, mentally to be able to make those financial decisions independently. And my final thought is that I'm thankful that we're not only talking about things that are in our wheelhouse because we'd have to listen to you talk about taxes <laughs> all day long. I'm just kidding. Hey, if, uh, if you guys are listening to this, uh, we're going to put in the show notes is uh, a link to our calendar. Uh, if you guys want to reach out and see how some of these strategies may apply to you specifically, is man, reach out, book a calendar, book a phone call with us. We'd love to talk to you about implementing some of these things. Enjoy the episode. Take care. Wade, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are excited to have you. Uh, if you could, could you start off giving us a little bit uh, about your background? Uh, it is my understanding that you actually got started kind of uh, down this road uh, back in Japan. Is that correct? Yeah, yep, that's right. Um, so I'm, I'm a professor of retirement income at the American College now, but Indeed, my first academic job, I, I was an economics professor in Tokyo. Okay. I lived there until 2013 and then came back to the U.S. I've been at the American College ever since working on retirement topics. And when you were uh, in Japan, right, as an economics professor, was it the 4% rule that kind of grabbed your attention that really kind of pulled you into uh, this industry? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's actually kind of, maybe somewhat accidentally it was that I just, I had this Morningstar data set, the global returns for 20 different countries. I I'd spent a big chunk of my research budget to get access to the data for a, a different project. And then I was just looking for ways I could use it. I don't know how I first came across the 4% rule of thumb, but I just thought it'd be interesting to look at whether it had worked with other countries' data. And then I wrote that up, sent it to the Journal of Financial Planning, had such positive response with that, that I, came to understand financial planning is also an academic field <laughs> and made the full switch over at that point. It's wow. Really suits me much better. That is cool. So for our listeners in Cameron, can you explain <laughs> what the 4% rule is? Sure. Sure. So, yeah, so that's, <laughs> you knew that was coming, right? I, I, I planned that all along. I did, but, I did. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's really the starting point for how the investments world thinks about retirement income. It was developed from an article that Bill Bingen wrote in 1994. So it's, it's already at this point, 26 years old. But he looked at historical U.S. data and, and just tried to figure out, well, based on actual market volatility historically, how much could you have spent as a percent of your portfolio at retirement and then sustain that for 30 years? And he found that based on the 1960s. If you retired in 1966 and got the market returns for the next 30 years, you could have just spent slightly over 4% at retirement and then sustained that for a 30-year retirement. So it builds in the idea of 30 years was meant to be conservative. It's meant to be this long retirement. And then also it's linked to the worst case 30-year market period in the historical data. And so it just says, well, if you can calibrate so that you can spend at 4% of your assets to meet your retirement goals, you should be fine. And that's how generally just the starting point for any sort of investment approach to retirement income. So in essence, just use round numbers. Let's say you have a million dollars in retirement assets. You could safely, in theory, take $40,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct? plus the plus inflation, you, you are allowed to just watch the consumer price index and increase it each year for that. But okay. yeah, that's the idea. Okay, perfect. So then what did you find about the, when you dove in deeper about the 4% rule? Mm -hmm. So that first article was really the surprise to me in terms of for these 20 different countries, and this is data going back to 1900, the 4% rule basically worked with US and Canadian data but it, it did not work in the other 18 countries. And when you're looking at the, well, the 4% rule is based on usually a 50 to 75% stock allocation. So looking at 50% stocks for retirement, the 4% rule around the world worked about 68% of the time. 
And if you wanted a withdrawal rate that could have worked 90% of the time, like around the world with all the country's data, you had to go as low as 2.8%. Wow. And, and it just really spoke to just this, the US, is this, the 20th century US is a pretty remarkable period in world history. And when you look at a more typical international experience, the 4% rule is not necessarily as safe. Yeah. And you had just touched on what it is with uh, 18 or 20 so different countries is that 4% has come down. What has it evolved to nowadays, right? I know just specifically talking about the U.S., it used to be 4. Is there a suggested safe withdrawal rate at this point? Well, I mean, so there's a lot of factors that can go into determining a more reasonable estimate. Uh, if you account for the historically low interest rates right now, if you wanted to make an adjustment for higher stock market valuations, if you wanted to account for investment fees, the 4% rule is just assuming you earn the index market returns and there are no investment fees. If you think that you might have to plan for longer than 30 years, uh, if you want to account for like taxes from a taxable portfolio, I mean, and so on and so on, the number can come down quite a bit. I do prepare estimates, mainly just the only thing I change is to account for the lower interest rates. And, and keep most of the other assumptions alone. And I get estimates right now with where interest rates are in the, to have a 90% a, a chance to work in the ballpark of 2.5% as a withdrawal rate. Okay, so back to our theory, if you had a million dollars, which I don't, I don't think the average American has a million dollars in retirement assets, but if they do, they could... they they could live off 28,000 a year. Yeah, I mean, following the logic, and yeah, that would be the, the implication. Okay, with 28,000, I would tell you, if I had a million bucks and I had to live off 28 grand, uh, I would not be happy. No, but no, you feel like you're a million, you are, you're a millionaire, but most people would not associate a millionaire with, Twenty-eight thousand dollars, or whatever the case may be, of, of spending power. But the sustainable spending level from a pot of assets, I think, is a lot lower than people expect. And that's interest rates are so important to that. When interest rates are low, the amount you can spend is less. It's a mathematical fact. When I've talked with some people about the four percent, a lot of people weren't even happy with the four percent rule. You know, if I saved a million bucks. I need more than 40,000 a year. And now you're telling me that's going to be closer to 30. A lot of people have gotten disappointed. I mean, some people that I've talked to, like, man, like I've worked and saved and, you know, for what? So then what do they do? Well, there, there's a number of different ways to get higher than... Actually, the, the way the 4% rule is constructed, it, it implies a spending strategy that no real person would actually follow. And it, it creates the most risk because of it. It's, you're always going to keep spending that same amount every year, no matter what's happening. And you're going to play this game of chicken, where if your portfolio is plummeting towards zero, you don't make any sort of adjustments to your plan. And even just the idea that if I could cut my spending a little bit during bad market environments, uh, that can go a long way towards helping to preserve a higher, at least initial spending level. And, and then beyond that, I mean, that's where if you want to look beyond just an investment portfolio, that's the role of insurance and so forth as part of the retirement plan, either risk pulling through an annuity to be able to, to spend more because you have the, you don't have to plan for as long of retirement because you have this risk pool. Those who end up not living as long, will help support payments to those who live longer. And then you can also have things like buffer assets, which are outside the investment portfolio that can be a temporary resource to spend from when the portfolio is in trouble. And that can also really help to, if, I mean, obviously, if I don't have to take every year's spending from my portfolio, I can use a higher spending fee. And the, the buffer asset can help with that. And I believe there's three types of buffer assets. What would those be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the original buffer ash asset was cash, a big pile of cash sitting outside the portfolio. I'm not a big fan of that buffer asset because the basic issue is if you didn't have the cash buffer asset, you could put the cash back in the portfolio 
And then you could use a lower withdrawal rate to actually meet a spending goal. And so I, I think in practical terms, and, and the research about it tends to indicate cash doesn't really work as a buffer asset. It, it's still part of the list. So the, the two that have more potential, well, the, the growing line of credit on a reverse mortgage or the cash value of whole life insurance. Those are both tools that households may have and that provide this opportunity. And also they're both proceeds from a loan, so tax-free access to a policy loan from cash value or borrowing through a reverse mortgage to provide that bridge, just a temporary spending resource so that if your portfolio is in trouble, you leave it alone and then you, with any sort of investment approach, you're always hoping that markets recover. But this builds the bridge so that if markets recover, you're you're preserving your portfolio so it can benefit more from that recovery. So kind of what I'm hearing is when the market has a bad year, the downside is if you continue to take your next year's withdrawal out of there, you know, that's less money in there for if and when the market does go up, you it's going to impact mm -hmm. you more because you have less assets in there. So you're saying instead of uh, after a bad year, instead of taking money from retirement assets, you take it from a buffer asset, whether the line of credit from reverse mortgage or cash value in your life insurance. Right, right. And that's, it's, this is the idea of sequence of returns risk, that when you're spending from your assets, if, if the market's down, you have to sell more shares to meet a spending goal. And then that's gone from your portfolio. So if the market comes back up, your portfolio is not benefiting from the recovery. And so you can't rely on say, the average market return over your retirement. You're really dependent on the market returns during a shorter period of time in your early retirement years. And if markets don't cooperate in the early retirement years, that can dig a hole for the portfolio that really becomes hard to ever come out from again. This idea of buffer assets is uh, is is relatively new, right? But uh, it's very powerful when you start to lay out some of these things. Um, you touched on two of them that I, I'd like to dive in a little bit deeper on. One is being the whole life insurance, then also um, kind of the reverse mortgage piece of it. Um, on the whole, on the life insurance piece of it, there's two. You know, I'm going to give you air quotes here. Permanent types of life insurance. You mentioned whole life insurance. What are your thoughts on the difference between whole life versus universal life? Well, um, so I, I should first just preface this with saying I do come from the investment side of financial services. And so I learn about life insurance as I go along. Uh, the way I understand it best, whole life insurance provides more guarantees in terms of premiums are fixed. You have guaranteed cash value and so forth. And with universal life insurance, people can, can run into issues where they might have to put in more premiums later on. There's no guarantee about premium levels. There's, it, there's an illustration for the policy, but it, if the policy doesn't perform, well, there's no clear downside worst case scenario with what's going on there. So, I mean, it, it's possible that one could use universal life insurance, but they would want to have pretty conservative assumptions. Just in general, I think full life insurance works better because the, the cash value is not exposed to market volatility. It's, it's like a, a principal protected bond. You, yeah. Even it's not exposed to interest rate risk. I mean, not everyone understands, but bonds can lose value. If interest rates go up and you try to sell your bond, you're gonna have to sell it for less. And the cash value of life insurance doesn't run into that type of issue. It has a clear downside of which is a growth rate for it. And if it pays, if it's a participating policy, you can exceed that mm -hmm. guaranteed level, but you can't fall below that level. And that's what makes it a really powerful buffer asset. As do we, right? And it's got an appropriate place uh, for us as a non-market correlated asset. But have you looked or done any sort of research into maybe when a good time to purchase uh, life insurance would be for somebody at certain ages, 30, 40, 50, something like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so when I've done simulations, testing different strategies, I've looked at starting ages from 35 to 50. And this is for someone planning for retirement at 65. And I found that they all work fine. Uh, just generally speaking, the earlier you start, the better. But certainly age 50 is not too late. It, it takes time for the cash value of life insurance to really start building up. And so you do want some runway. 
if you're closer to retirement and you're insurable and everything, you might also even just think about it as maybe not for the first part of retirement, but you'll build up this buffer asset for perhaps a bit later in retirement as well. Cool. And have, you kind of touched on it a minute ago is what are your thoughts on, on the idea of replacing um, kind of your bonds with permanent life insurance? Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's certainly how I, I think about it. And this is more generally any sort of annuity or life insurance, I, I view as a type of actuarial bond, that it's especially, I mean, whole life insurance, you're, you're investing in the insurance company's general account, which is pretty often, it varies from company to company, but it could be 80 to 90% bonds but they have this ability to invest for higher yields than the household can because they can deal with a lack of liquidity with longer terms to maturity and with credit risk and so forth. So you've got a high quality bond portfolio. And I think it's quite reasonable to then think of that as part of your bond holdings. Like when I do my own investing, I have a whole life policy now. And I, when I calculate, well, what's my stock bond mix? I include the cash value as, as part of my bond allocation. I mean, it's not strictly the same as holding a bond, but I think it very much behaves in a similar manner, and I treat it that way. So what I'm hearing with, with this strategy is, again, let, let, we have these bucket of retirement assets. What you're saying is one option is you can re basically like reallocate some of those assets into life insurance to either replace your bond portfolio and or be in a position for to have this bu this buffer asset or are you saying add more money in you know additional cash flow into the uh life insurance well i have now i've looked at really so i these simulations i do i'm testing the old like the the buy term and invest a difference approach for where you need life insurance pre-retirement. So should you just get term insurance and put as much as you can into your investment portfolio? Or should you start thinking of it ahead to retirement and using whole life insurance to have that permanent life insurance for retirement as well? But because the premiums are higher, then you put less into your investment portfolio. And any of the four ways I've looked at all can add value. And that's just as a more efficient way to fund a legacy goal than just trying to preserve investment assets for that person. It's something called the covered asset strategy, which is with the life insurance in place, you don't have to build life insurance into annuities. So you can use like a, a life only single life income annuity up to the value of the, the life insurance death benefit. And, and that'll get a higher payout rate. And so that can be an effective way to just have the life insurance cover the premium used to purchase lifetime income through an annuity. Uh, the, the buffer asset approach that we've been talking about is another one where you just treat the cash value of the life insurance as a resource. I, I do treat it as part of your asset allocation, but I don't strictly uh, treat it as part of the portfolio exactly. It's just, it's outside the portfolio, but it's the resource you can draw from to help preserve the portfolio at bad times. And then the fourth is more just simply, like if you're gonna put money into a taxable bond fund versus just thinking of the cash value of life insurance as an alternative to holding bonds and not even putting that much weight on the death benefit, I find that it can provide competitive net of tax returns, especially if you did pre-retirement have a life insurance need. So you would also be paying for a term premium as well. That That term premium plus the taxes on bonds uh, you can potentially have a better outcome just with cash value life insurance as an alternative to that. To jump back to that covered asset strategy, you talked about uh, putting an annuity in place or having one there to cover the death benefit. Um, that's a, a SPIA, correct, is what you're referring to? Yeah, a single premium immediate annuity. You could use other types of annuities too, but that's always the simplest starting point. And when you have the the like death benefit or the the life insurance through the life insurance itself, you can really go for the highest payout possible from the annuity, which would generally be with a, a single life, life only, single premium immediate annuity. Okay, so with with a single life only to get that max income, the advantage is that's you're gonna get the high the highest payout. 
The downside is it only lasts the life of, of that one individual. <laughs> a lot of times people are married and then they don't want to do that because what's, what's, what's the surviving spouse going to do? Right, right. So then, a single life, right. <laughs> the single life SPIA will often have, when I've looked at it, you know, 15 to 20% more spending power at age 65 than a joint life SPIA. But the, the point is, if you have a joint life SPIA, that's a way to have life insurance because that's a way to protect the spouse. And when you compare that to, you know, I'll just have life insurance through the life insurance. Like if I have a million dollar death benefit in my life insurance, I could buy a million dollars of a SPIA, life only, single life. And then if I pass away, so that the annuity income stops, but then the death benefit comes to the household to replace that asset. And then the surviving spouse, at that point, they're going to be older. They probably don't have to even annuitize the full million dollars at that point to keep the same income level. But they have that opportunity to, if they want, purchase more lifetime income as well that way. Okay, so you, you kind of hedge that bet. If that, as soon as that person writes a check for that annuity, God forbid something happens to them, we have that permanent death benefit where in essence, we could do the same thing on the surviving spouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, it provides that flexibility that, I mean, it's possible that the spouse could pass away first and then the death benefit goes to the heirs. But if, the, if it is a surviving spouse, the one who didn't have the annuity, then yeah, the, the death benefit from the life insurance will make sure that they have the opportunity to get back on track there and either purchase an annuity themselves or not. But they have the flexibility to make that choice. Wade, when we've looked at this for a client and I've and we've read your white paper, which we're actually going to have a link in the show notes to his white paper as long to the list of books that Wade has uh, written. Well, I, I we we've also created a series of videos. That, that dive a little deeper, like when he talks about the sequence of, of returns, we do the math behind that. So we do have some videos there on, on the Infinite Wealth course. Um, so to me, when I first read this, like a light bulb went off, like this just made total sense. And in part, because what I found, at least through my research, what I, what I found when people are in retirement, their biggest concern or the biggest worry is being, is, is having to depend on their children. And then their second one is having to run out of money. And a lot of times people save and we have all this money in retirement assets, but then I don't know if the stock market is the best way to flip a switch and start turning it, turning it into income. And a lot of people don't know how much to safely take out, but with using your strategy, whether it's a volatility buffer or the covered asset approach, what I love about it, it gives some people some peace, it gives them some certainty that there's going to be some guaranteed income. Uh, so to me, I, I really love the approach. I would tell you my, my one concern about it would be is if we do this covered asset where we have an annuity and then that's paying out lifetime income, my concern would be what, what if there's, uh, what if there's hyperinflation mm -hmm. and then, yeah, you, know, a... <laughs> you know, could you ha help me through that uh, uh, concern. It's a valid concern, and so this is something I've looked at a lot and generally come to the conclusion that you don't necessarily need to plan for the inflation with the annuity itself. But the idea is, I think often people default to this idea that everything's an all or nothing decision. Like I either put all my assets into an annuity or nothing. Yeah. And that's not what we're talking about here. It's the annuity can provide a way to carve out a portion of the assets to more efficiently meet the lifetime spending obligation, which then frees up the other assets. You, you, now, you have risk capacity. Your lifestyle is protected. It's not vulnerable to a market downturn. 
so you can invest your other assets more aggressively. It's, it's kind of that same idea of think of the annuity as part of the bond holdings for the household. And then it's through that investment portfolio and through being able to use a lower withdrawal rate from your remaining investments, because at least initially, but even if the investments have to cover all the inflation adjustments, that partial annuity strategy where you don't have inflation protection in the annuity, but you seek the inflation protection through the growth of the investment portfolio. I think that can be a, a pretty good overall way to approach the issue of inflation. Because it is a downside. Annuities don't provide inflate, or they can, but it can be quite expensive. Yeah. Uh, so seek the inflation protection elsewhere. You're integrating different tools together, and, and it's the other tools that give you the inflation protection. Yeah, because we've had these tools and softwares that will take like a client's retirement assets, okay, based on where we use a 4% rule or the 2.8, you know, right? here's how much cash flow you can have in retirement. But then we can calculate, well, what if we use the volatility buffer or what if we use the uh, covered asset? We can calculate what that cash flow is going to be in retirement. What Every time I've run it, we've always been able to make more cash flow in retirement by having some of those additional assets outside the market. And I tell you, what I like to do is really, uh, I like the covered asset and the volatility buffer, but I personally, I like a combination of the two where th this way we don't have all of it in an annuity, but we also have the volatility. I mean, so I think that mm -hmm. way, we can really get the best of the best of both worlds. Yeah, that's how I was actually viewing it as well. You just have to be a little bit careful because like with the covered asset strategy, you're saying, well, I'm going to use that death benefit to back up the annuity premium. And then with the buffer asset, you're saying, well, I'm willing to eat into the death benefit because I'm willing to borrow from the cash value, which will then offset the death benefit at the end. But you don't necessarily need that big a volatility buffer. So I think, and especially as well as people age, annuity rates increase by age so that you may not be able to, I mean, you may be able to replace the annuity income with less than the death benefit as you go along. So I think there is capacity from there to do the covered asset strategy and then do a limited volatility buffer, maybe up to say the cost basis of the policy or something like that as a way to get a lot of the benefits of the volatility buffer, plus the, the benefit of having an annuity in the strategy as well. Uh, speaking of annuities and kind of our current environment being low interest rates is, can you maybe touch on the case that, uh, or for annuities um, having a stronger case for being purchased in a low interest rate environment? I'm not, if I, I don't know if I'm asking mm -hmm. that correctly, but to a lot of people when they talk about purchasing annuities right now, will say, hey, I wanna defer that choice off to a little bit later when interest rates come up. But mm -hmm. my, my understanding is it's actually almost uh, a little illogical is that there's a stronger case for annuities in a low interest rate environment. Right, right. The, the case for annuities actually really, it becomes stronger when interest rates are lower. Uh, it's true that annuities become more expensive when interest rates are lower. But the problem is everything becomes more expensive. And the cost of investments tends to grow faster than the cost of the annuities. And that, so I mean, just think about somebody who's retired today and is spending from their assets and they say, well, interest rates are low. I'm just going to wait and I'll buy an annuity later when interest rates go up. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, they're spending down their assets. Interest rates may never go up. I mean, the best predictor of future interest rates is where we are today. And people have been expecting interest rates to go up for probably seven or eight years now, and they just keep going. I mean, there's only so much further down they can go, but they, they have kept going down. And then if interest rates do go up, if you were investing for any sort of yield with your bond holdings, you're going to have capital losses. Uh, if you're holding your money in cash, you won't have capital losses, but you're not yielding anything in the meantime. And so then at the point where if interest rates went up, you would get a higher payout rate on the annuity. But as you've been spending down your assets in the meantime and you have that interest rate risk, you're not necessarily going to be able to purchase more income in the future. So there's not necessarily any value in waiting. And then more broadly, it's just in a low in so annuities have three sources of spending power: the return of principal, the interest earned from the insurance company's general account, 
And then the mortality credits are the risk pooling. And when interest rates are low, the, the interest piece is lower. But that makes the mortality credits all the more important. They're not impacted by interest rates. And so they help to limit the, the overall cost of retirement versus just a bond portfolio. When interest rates go down, I need a lot more bonds to fund my retirement. The cost of funding my retirement that way grows faster than the cost of funding my retirement with the annuity. So there's a bigger spread. The, relatively speaking, the annuity on an absolute value is more expensive, but on a relative basis, it's cheaper than the alternatives in a lower interest rate environment. The case for an annuity becomes stronger in a lower interest rate environment. Awesome. Thank you for clarifying that because I think that's a piece that is often misunderstood. Another yes. piece that's often misunderstood would be kind of real estate, to be totally honest with you. And that is kind of the conversation of reverse mortgages and how to handle those or the options that are available to people uh, when they do reach retirement. Could you introduce us to kind of that third uh, buffer asset, which is reverse mortgages? Mm -hmm. What What is that? Yeah, sure. And, and yeah, I mean, let me just preface that by saying that it, being a professor of retirement income, I, I tend to get a lot of tomatoes thrown at me because I, I start <laughs> speaking about tools that don't necessarily, they're not necessarily popular in the yeah. conventional wisdom. And But it's really a, an issue of managing these risks that retirees face this longevity risk. They don't know how long they're going to live. And then they face market risk, but market risk that's further amplified by that sequence of returns risk problem that we talked about. And that makes it harder to just straight up fund a retirement through an investment portfolio. There's this idea of stocks for the long run, that, that stocks will outperform bonds if you hold them for long enough, but you're, you don't get to fully benefit from that in retirement because of this sequence of returns risk. And so there can be a role for other tools that can help be integrated to manage these risks in a more efficient manner, whether it's annuities, life insurance, or reverse mortgages. I wrote a, a book about reverse mortgages, and it's it's mainly a tool to help manage, there is a tool to, to manage the sequence of returns risk in retirement. It can be done in different ways. Uh, the most popular use is more and more Americans are carrying mortgages into retirement. Mm. That creates a problem because you have this higher fixed expense in your early retirement years. It'll go away later, but this increases your sequence of returns risk. And if you can refinance that fixed mortgage payment into a reverse mortgage, that can help manage that sequence of returns risk and give you a big outcome in the end. So that's the most popular use. There's other possibilities as well, but to, most of the, the research about reverse mortgages, it's they call them like, coordinated portfolio strategies, coordinating your reverse mortgage with your investment portfolio. But it's exactly the same conversation as the, the buffer asset, volatility buffer with cash value. Right? It seemed to just have evolved independently where people on the life insurance side understood how life insurance could be a buffer asset. And then starting in about 2012, people on the reverse mortgage side started understanding how a reverse mortgage could work as that volatility buffer. And it's completely a parallel conversation. They're both potential buffer assets for a retirement income plan. And at the at most, most basic level for our listeners or for Anthony in particular, could you explain the difference between a reverse mortgage and like a HELOC or something? I think more people are familiar <laughs> with that than they are with a reverse mortgage. Right, right. So a traditional home equity line of credit can give you that ability to tap into your home equity for spending but it can be frozen or canceled and it can require a quicker repayment and so forth. And that's, so one of the early researchers in the reverse mortgage area was this team from Texas Tech University, which is kind of the Harvard of financial planning programs, the Harold Levinsky and, and some of his colleagues, and also well-known financial advisors, they had HELOCs for all their clients. And then after the financial crisis in 2008, mm -hmm. and we're seeing this happen now as well, all those HELOCs got frozen and canceled. And so exactly at the point their clients might want to use those, they realized they can't rely on them. And then they started looking into, well, there's this reverse mortgage program, the home equity conversion mortgage, the HECM. It provides with a, a variable rate HECM, which is what most more 90% plus people use these days. It provides a line of credit that can grow over time 
and that has these protections, it can't be frozen or canceled. Plus the fact that it grows, that's the, the main difference from the traditional HELOC. You have this resource that you definitely can use as a buffer asset, even in a financial crisis. Now, what happens as that HELOC or that home equity loan balance is rising? And what if something happens to the housing market and now the, the value of the home is much less than, than the loan against it? Mm -hmm. So the HECM program, it has costs associated with it. And a big chunk of those costs are mortgage insurance premiums. And one of those uses of the mortgage insurance premiums is it's a non-recourse loan that the amount that has to be repaid will not be more than 95% of the appraised value of the home at the time the loan becomes due. So if there is a downturn in the housing market and your home is worth less than the loan balance, you, you're limited. You don't have to pay back more than that 95% appraised value of the home. And the mortgage insurance fund would then compensate the lender for the difference there. So you, you have that protection that you're not, the home is the only collateral that, that's part of that loan. Okay, because some of the people, because we've I've had a client where all of her money, her assets were inside her home. She really, unfortunately, didn't have any retirement assets. And she was really living off of Social Security. Mm -hmm. And then the house got too expensive because it was getting older, property taxes, maintenance. She wanted to move into something a little smaller and closer to her family. And we had taught, but then she didn't have enough cash flow to meet her expenses. And so we talked about a potentially reverse mortgage and her first reaction was like I said something I mean she got not offended but oh no there's no I'm not doing a reverse mortgage I can't I mean there's a lot of these misconceptions about it and so what would you say to somebody who just like I, I, I I've just been told they're bad I mean what what can we use to kind of open people's minds to potentially do, uh, use looking just evaluating a reverse mortgage yeah i mean that is the conventional wisdom that they're they're bad and they're just associated with late night tv commercial infomercial type things and so forth and it's, there's been a lot of changes in the program because it's a program administered through the federal government so there's more like financial assessments to make sure people do have enough other assets there's protections for non-borrowing spouses and so forth and so on. And the media coverage has got a lot more positive. It used to be that most stories in the media were negative about reverse mortgages and were often just written from the perspective of a child who believed they were going to inherit the house and then figured yeah. out their parents had a reverse mortgage. And so the children were upset <laughs> that they didn't get their inheritance. And the, that's the, how the article's written. But we don't, we still see that from time to time, but most of the media coverage in, in like Kiplinger's or Time Magazine and so forth, it's much more positive now. So maybe just sharing some of that and, and talking about at the end of the day, it's just a way to be able to incorporate your home equity into your retirement spending plan. Because otherwise the house is a liquid. And the conventional wisdom is the reverse mortgage is a last resort option. That if everything else goes wrong, okay, as a last resort, I'll use a reverse mortgage. But if you're thinking ahead about how you might use home equity in retirement, that last resort approach is really the worst possible way to do it. And so it's worth just revisiting this and giving it another look. What I would say is as more information comes out about these is people have a better understanding of, of a reverse mortgage as a tool. And I'm going to give you credit for that, right? Is you look at the books and the research that you've done. I mean, I think you are intentional about trying to be independent and in providing kind of data driven research to consumers and saying, Hey, this is how it works. Take it or leave it. Right. It, trying to be unbiased <laughs> in a lot of these things. And so uh, the book where I would send somebody where I've sent people is, Hey, if you've got any questions on how this is going to come into play is read this book, right? Cause you do a very thorough front to back on reverse mortgages and provide on uh options for people to use these as a tool mm -hmm. oh, yeah well thanks and, and yeah that's just 
what I do is I write programs to simulate different retirement strategies. And I, the reason tools like reverse mortgages, annuities, life insurance have an opportunity to show these positive results is really just, is again, this whole issue of the sequence risk and the, yeah. the retirement longevity risk. These tools, even though they have costs associated with them, can help build efficiencies into the retirement plan versus just being hyper conservative with an investment portfolio where you can't spend as much because you're worried you'll outlive your money. Well, if you look at it more broadly, you have this ability to build a better overall retirement strategy. That's the starting point for all these sorts of simulations I do. You had, you had mentioned tomatoes earlier. I would assume that a lot of tomatoes would be coming from kind of the investment world when you put out a book about reverse mortgages and real estate is because <laughs> there's, a, right, I, I mentioned it before, is there's a misunderstanding or the traditional kind of investment advisor um, may not fully understand real estate or things that aren't fall under that umbrella of their typical portfolio. And so, uh, right, when you put something in there like this, uh, I, you know, I think there's a, a curve there where people have to, try to understand it to get really get on board there. So thanks for putting this information out. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And I would say to be, I would always going through that scenario with, with my client with, with reverse mortgage did open my eyes more, but before our conversation, I was, always, you know, that's, that's a last resort, but I, you've opened my eyes to kind of seeing more of the bigger picture and that's just part of your assets. And so, um, thanks for, for sharing that. Let me put that in the form of, of kind of a question is, uh, you mentioned that, uh, reverse mortgages or, or home equity has been a kind of a last resort. What are your thoughts on kind of a spend down strategy? I've heard this strategy as far as retirement spending of, Hey, we're going to spend down maybe taxable or tax deferred assets first. And then mm -hmm. either fund kind of some of those tax-free assets or wait till the end to draw on those. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so there's, it's a pretty interesting area. I mean, the, the basic rule of thumb is spend your taxable assets, then tax deferred, and then tax-free. And then the reality is you can just fine tune that better where ultimately you're saying, okay, here's some sort of tax bracket, some adjustable gross income level that I can manage throughout my retirement so that I don't have to go above that level and pay at a higher tax rate. But if I'm below that level, I might want to generate more taxable income to get myself up to that. And so what that means is you're spending taxable assets first, but you're, you may offset that through spending from your tax deferred account to generate more taxable income, either through strategic Roth conversions or just as a source of spending. And then once your taxable account's gone, then you switch over to well, I'm going to spend from my tax deferred account up to that tax bracket I've got in mind and then spend anything else I need. I could spend from the, the tax free account, which would be a Roth account. Or when we talk about these buffer assets, that's another area where cash value life insurance, reverse mortgage, they're, they're proceeds from a loan. So they're also a way to generate more taxable spending power without creating something that is added to your adjusted gross income. Great. Wade, I know we need to wrap up because you have you have a hard stop here coming up. One question I'd like to ask you is, you, with your background, you came from an, you were an investment guy, just like you talked about. But then now, you somehow made that transition to whole life insurance and annuities and reverse mortgages. What kind of led to that conversion? Because typically in the investment world, all of those assets are, are taboo. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So I, I'm from the investments world with like the, the CFA designation, and I work with a, a fee-only financial planning firm, which historically has been investments, <laughs> primarily focused on investments as well. But yeah, I was concerned about that investments approach. And then... I, I was, of course, very cautious about things like annuities, but as I started to learn more about them and how they can better manage these risks, I came to understand the value of annuities more. And then I was hearing from people, well, if you, if you like annuities now, why don't you look at life insurance? And okay, well, then I, so then I started looking at that as well and came to view how that could potentially have a positive impact on the retirement plan as well. And it's just kind of the same story with the reverse mortgages as well, where 
I shared the conventional wisdom that I, as a re professor of retirement income, it's something I should look at, but I wasn't in any hurry because it didn't seem all that important. But I got invited to a meeting and John Salter at Texas Tech University sent me a stack of articles about reverse mortgages, I was reading those on the flight and became really interested in that and just started testing out how that looked as well, recreating some of that past research to see if I could get the same results and then just trying to move it forward from there as well. So that's the general process where kind of that scope of tools has been expanding. We've got a, a bigger toolkit now, not just the investment portfolio. Awesome. Is there anything you're working on currently that uh, may be coming out soon or look forward to? I've been trying to write a, a fourth and final book that's more of that complete look at all the different aspects of retirement. So I've finished writing about Social Security now. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, you asked about the tax planning, and that's an area I've been looking at a lot now. So in the future, I'm looking forward to do more research in this area because writing programs to do tax-efficient retirement strategies is pretty complicated. But I've got a system working now as well for that. So nice. that's been another area with some new content. too. Well, I look forward to uh, anything that you put out. So I really appreciate uh, your time today, and uh, thank you again for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Doc. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure.